Um, let's talk about, and, and like I say, and like you said, it, it, it's hard to know exactly how much of this is Donald Trump genuinely believing this. I, I, I it recalls to mind the story of Sam Israel, who was a, um, who you may recall was a, um, like a, had, had basically created this very fraudulent hedge fund uh, back mm-hmm. uh, maybe in the wake of Madoff. I'm not sure exactly uh, if I can uh, place it, but he ended up, um, he had created this stolen hundreds of millions of dollars, essentially, um, but ended up getting ensnared in a con himself <laughs> about the uh, believing that there was a secret Fed that uh, only rich people had access to. And he ended up getting swindled uh, with money that he had swindled. But it was largely because he had grown up in an environment on Wall Street where he just assumed that everybody was as fraudulent uh, as he had seen. And so he just, and, and, it, and there is a quality of like Donald Trump where I think you're, you're alluding to that maybe even go beyond uh, just being raised in real estate, just when you're crooked, there's a reason to believe that other that everything is crooked on some level. And that's also, I think, part of the re- way that you justify operating in that way is just like doing what everybody else is doing. Um, what, what, uh, give me a sense of, of, of those, though, that are enabling him. I know you've written quite extensively on Bill Barr, because in many respects, he seems to me to be the most dangerous person in the administration because um, he's he seems to be fairly competent at what his uh, project is, uh, maybe more so than others. Um, tell us a little bit about Bill Barr and how he ended up, uh, his history in this regard. So he is, I, I, I call him the most sort of feared and effective member of the, the cabinet. Um, and, and again, I'll talk about the rationalizations and conspiracy theories and stuff like that. So he's, in Barr's defense, um, for decades, um, he has believed that that the presidency is the most important branch of the U.S. government, and he has believed that after Watergate, some of the reforms I mentioned, where you have uh, inspectors general and and um, independent counsels like Robert Mueller, and you have even these these oversight committees, the intelligence committees, you know, watching what the president is doing, watching what executive branch agencies are doing, is weakening the presidency in a way that endangers the country. Um, Barr gave a speech last fall to the Federal Society, and he he argued that throughout American history, when the country's faced war or you know economic cal- calamity, and now you could say pandemic, it's the presidency that saved the country. That that Congress is too divided to act. The judiciary obviously doesn't have the the means or the mechanisms to do it. And so you know, friends of his told me that Barr is you know, joined the Trump administration to protect the presidency. He felt it had been weakened too much after Watergate. It was being weakened too much by all these attacks uh, on Trump. And that's his rationale for what he's done. Um, you know, I think he's gone too far, but that's his rationale, at least. I mean, I know this is a little bit outside your portfolio as, as a reporter, uh, but I mean, give me your assessment of, of how rational that take is. I mean, um, because by all accounts, it appears that the presidency is as powerful as it's ever been. I mean, if it's the case that um, that the 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 FBI and the CIA was rogue in the you know, uh, and that um, you know, uh, it, it, prior to the the Church Committee, I mean. The, you haven't had Congress question the presidency uh, presidents whatsoever on like uh, waging war, which I would imagine is like the biggest power yep. that you have as the president. Um, the idea that the presidency needs to be strong to deal with a pandemic does not look like that theory is just not bearing out. Uh, it, it appears like, uh, frankly, right now. I mean, how how rational do you think Barr's assessment is? I mean, you can't get into his head to know if it's sincere. But something's yep. driving him. I, I mean, I, you know, that that seems to be, uh, you know, who knows what. But as a political project, that seems to be just sort of like, really? You think that after um, after the Bush administration, after even Barack Obama creating a legal framework to assassinate American citizens, um, yep. th- uh, that just seems, I don't know, uh, a hard proposition to accept. 
You're, you're right. And, and I mean, there are major changes in the 70s. One of the things is the, what you just mentioned, the War Powers Act. So I do think the presidency was, you know, was weakened, some would say appropriately in the 70s. But and then you're right, post 9-11, presidency comes roaring back. George W. Bush carries out, you know, unprecedented, you know, renditions around the world. There's a bunch of things we can talk about. And yeah, Barack Obama uh, comes up with a legal fr- framework to assassinate Americans in drone strikes without any public court proceeding. You know, Anwar al awlaki you know, Yemeni American, um, a U.S. citizen, you know, killed by the U.S. government. Um, and, and I think that's an excess that happened sort of post 9-11. So I, I do, I disagree with Barr. Um, the current example was, you know, Barr said, you know, it was outrageous that when Trump, you know, announced his travel ban right after he became president, that there was some, you know, federal judge on the West Coast that could issue an injunction that could prevent the travel ban from being carried out nationwide. Um, you know, and where Barr goes way too far is, you know, essentially, our, he supported Trump's stonewalling of the impeachment proceedings against him uh, regarding Ukraine. Uh, Barr cooperated less with the impeachment investigation. Sorry, Barr and Trump cooperated less to the impeachment investigation. They, they blocked all access to witnesses, i.e. John Bolton, who we can talk about as well. Um, they refused to hand over any documents regarding Ukraine to Congress. Um, Nick, Nixon handed things over. And famously, when it went to the Supreme Court, you know, there was a unanimous vote that the Nixon Oval Office tapes had to go uh, be turned over to investigators. So it's, it's, I, I think he's gone too far. It's scary. Um, it's a rebalancing of power that Barr supports um, that where you're just rejecting a clear constitutional power of Congress to investigate and impeach a president. But is he creating any structural change? I mean, he's running around to Italy. He's running around to various countries around the, the, the globe trying to put together this narrative of a rogue FBI that um, was inappropriately investigating him, that presumably was, you know, part of a, a broader Biden Clinton, uh, you know, complex that was that was doing this. Where, where is if, if his concern is the integrity and the strength of the presidency, as opposed to Donald Trump's personal, um, you know, personal fortunes? Where is the structural changes that he's making or that he's able to make from that position? It just seems like he's just functioning as Donald Trump's personal lawyer and there's no, there's nothing that is precedential about what he's doing. Well, I think there's, you know, the ruling last week on DACA um, shows that, that he, he, it all depends on, you know, how the court rules on these various things where there's pending cases on, you know, can Congress force Don McGahn to testify um, as part of an impeachment inquiry? That that ruling hasn't come about yet. But uh, the DACA ruling last week was an example of John Roberts joining the four liberals on the court to say that um, the you know government's that the Trump administration's you know uh, cancellation of DACA was um, you know capricious. Like it was so random that it it, it was therefore illegal. Um, so I was much more worried that all of this executive privilege, all this blocking of access to White House records that Barr supported, um, the president's tax returns, you know, that's going to the Supreme Court also, that um, that Barr would succeed if the Supreme Court, you know, decided these cases in Trump's favor. Um, you know, there's a lot more cases to be decided, but the judicial branch, and you're going to hear me over and over, I want a divided government. I want three co-equal branches holding each other in check. So in recent weeks, you see uh, the judicial branch uh, pushing back, the judge pushing back on, on the Michael Flynn case where Barr you know, drops the charges against Flynn. So it's actually the judicial branch that, that's pushing back hardest at Trump. Uh, Congress has largely failed. I mean, that's the I mean, that's I mean, uh, the I guess the uh, the former, you know, uh, the president's ability just by executive order to uh, reverse things based on a whim. Um, but it, it, it sort of feels like, you know, the answer that they, we got from the Supreme Court was like he can do it. He's just got to be 
less incompetent in the context, you know, even in, <laughs> even in the census question, right? Like they, I mean, they, uh, the census question essentially was a rebuke to, um, to, uh, to Bill Barr, but it wasn't a rebuke to the, to the theory that Barr was operating under. It was just a rebuke to like, Hey, we literally have someone who's provided evidence that you're lying to us because, you know, he died. Like we literally, like, we can't make this decision. Even if we desperately wanted to, we couldn't, cause it's so obvious you're lying to us. Like just go yeah. back and, you know, like if you had just come to us with, you know, even a, just a slightly plausible, the dog ate our homework uh, uh, excuse, you would have won here. Like, is this, how are these people, how is Bill Barr so dedicated to these sort of structural changes, but is so inept at them yet here he is with like, you know, Flynn or doing this stuff with Berman. And I want to talk about that as well. Yeah. And none of that is, you know, getting rid of Berman, it seems to me, or reducing Flynn's uh, a sentence that does not seem to be structurally enhancing the power of the president. That seems to be, working as Donald Trump's personal lawyer? Uh, yes. And, but I think the rationale for Barr is that, you know, there never should have been a um, investigation of, you know, the Trump campaign and its contacts with Russia, that the special prosecutor sort of pressured Flynn into making this guilty plea. Um, I, I agree with you. I mean, if you look at the pattern and, and just even this week, so with Berman, you know, it's astonishing. Like the Bolton book comes out. Uh, Bolton says that he, you know, warned Barr that the president is, you know, offering, uh, you know, Erdogan, the Turkish leader, to get rid of a case brought by federal prosecutors of a, you know, Turkish company that could embarrass Erdogan. But so, so there's this, you know, allegation, you know, anyway, it's a, you know, an, a narrative that Trump is intervening in all these cases. Uh, and then what is, you know, Barr denies that publicly. And then on Friday night, he fires the very federal prosecutor at the center of all this um, in New York. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's the same incompetence that you've talked about. But I think one of the lessons of this whole era is how, you know, fragile our system is. And you can just defy norms, you know, whether you've got some constitutional rationale or you just want to serve the president that you love, um, you know, Reports can be suppressed. Inspectors general can be fired who are supposed to look at billions of dollars in coronavirus funding. Uh, you know, again, Congress over and over is just kind of rolling over when it's their president in the White House. So there's just all kinds of warning signs about the challenges we face that I think go beyond the Trump era. What do you think is behind the, um, the, the, the Berman firing? I mean, and just to be clear for people, um, Barr claim that Berman resigned by resigning because of a, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. there's a, like, yeah. there's a civil service statute essentially that says if he resigns, there is more latitude for uh, the administration to appoint someone who does not come from the agency. Um, however, if he's removed it's necessarily his assistant. There's a, there's a specific ascension that or succession that is uh, mandated. Now they wanted to put in the head of the SEC who coincidentally represented Deutsche Bank, which supposedly coincidentally is one of the investigations that Berman is up to in terms of his, their relationship with Donald Trump. Um, Berman ultimately decides that he will leave um, because he, he he claimed that when, when Barr was forcing him that he could only be fired essentially by the judge that appointed him, he was willing to leave once he had secured a commitment that his assistant, uh, Amy Strauss, I think it is, would be, a, yep. uh, would be appointed the acting director until the Senate uh, approved somebody. Lindsey Graham had come out that day um, and said, we won't approve the guy from the SEC. What, what do you think is behind this? I mean, you're five months out from an election. What what do you think is behind them wanting to get rid of Berman? I it could be the you know Berman is reported to be investigating Giuliani and his dealings in Ukraine, um, and this is the kind of 
the the I've just written a piece on this. It's being edited by a colleague of mine at the New Yorker. But it's this Berman firing combines the kind of sort of rank corruption, you know, i.e., we're going to protect Rudy Giuliani and anybody else in Trump's circle in New York from investigation with sort of sheer incompetence, like how you can try to do this in a press release at 9.15 p.m. on a Friday night, Barr falsely stated, as you said, that Berman had agreed to resign when he hadn't. Um, and how you think you're gonna kind of pull this off, you know, it's kind of astonishing. Um, so it's such, a, it's a, such a strange time, but it, it is really dangerous. And I think the only reason this sort of failed was you mentioned Lindsey Graham. I mean, the president's poll numbers are down. Graham is facing a strong Democratic challenger, you know, for his seat right. um, in I South Carolina in November. And so Graham blocks it. He says, no, I'm not going to let the, you know, the head of the SEC, who's also a golf buddy of the president, you know, basically take over and squelch all these investigations in, in New York. So, um I just feel everything's very tenuous these days, that the system isn't working as we, it's not as strong as we think. Um, and, and we need to all engage more I, in I mean, our democracy. What's your sense as to, I mean, um, do you have a theory as to, I mean, they clearly were incompetent in the way that they executed this. Do you have a theory as to why they were attempting to do this? I mean, um, I mean, presumably, right? Like, uh, a bar if these if these there well, let's put it this way there's no way that berman five months out from the election or four months out from the election is going to indict the sitting president's personal attorney right i mean yeah, they're, 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 that's not happening the, and, and all of these the, and there's no way that he's going to move on deutsche bank uh in relationship to the president four or five months out from election right i mean like th that is the that was rule number one of the Department of Justice in relationship to elections, you know, prior to uh, Comey announcing this. Seems yeah. to me yeah. what Donald Trump is signaling here is he's afraid he's going to lose the election. And then the investigation is going to move forward after he's out of office and he's going to lose all his leverage to shut it down and that they needed to essentially derail or taint or resolve all of these investigations prior to the election. That could be it. Um, you know, Bolton specifically mentioned Berman and, and that Trump offered to, you know, he said he could have Berman squelch this investigation into this Turkish company that would have embarrassed Erdogan. I mean, so there's a small chance that an enraged Trump, you know, demands that this be done. But I, I find, I, again, I think there's, he has very effectively marginalized the press. He has, you know, constantly attacked judges who rule against him. Um, he's mocked Congress and just defied it, just, just defied congressional subpoenas. And he is, you know, for a large part of the American public, he's discredited these other power centers. So, you know, you could be right. Um, you know, and what leads Barr to, I think Barr was pressured to do it. I just can't imagine Barr would do it in this way at, at this time. But again, I, I just, you know, so it's been a, if you're worried about the fate of American democracy, the failure of this effort, um, you know, uh, over the weekend, you know, should make you feel good that, that there's enough political pressure on Lindsey Graham to, to not be part of this. But it's, it's, it's just a mind boggling kind of what is happening uh, week after week. And it's going to, intensify between now and november oh yes all right well so lastly let me just ask you about this about bill barr because i find him to be the most fascinating character in this um in this administration what what is your sense about what happened at lafayette square i mean bill barr assembles right like he claims that it was um that the lafayette square protests you know he walked out right before the 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 president was to walk to this church and noticed hey wait a second there's all these protesters here and uh i think he's he's quoted as saying i didn't tell them to get it done i just was like i didn't say go do it i just wondered uh, you know why it wasn't getting done or something there was some like a, a thing that he said there that i don't know how he you know at one point he gets a little legalistic uh, for his own good but what what is your sense of that i mean somebody brought up all of these federal 
prison, you know, guards or uh, CPB specialty uh, forces or, you know, somehow knowing that they'd be used for something. Um, what, what do you make of, of all that? I, I think that um, I'll go back to my, like the danger of people rationalizing things. I want to give Bill Barr the men of the doubt. I think he knows what he's doing, but he spread all these Antifa conspiracy theories. And there's been great reporting about how in all the federal arrests, they haven't found Antifa, you know, doing anything. Uh, and again, for decades, Barr was like a law and order guy. He, he, you know, after the, during the Rodney King riots when he was attorney general under George H.W. Bush, he sent federal officers out there. So he believes that you kind of dominate, you know, the street. Um, but he's just gone too far. And I'll just end on this, this weekend. He, you know, he'll, so he gave a Fox interview this weekend, all this stuff has happened with Berman. And part of the interview is he says that mail-in voting, you know, is a, you know, going to open the floodgates for fraud in November. That's on Sunday. This morning, you know, President Trump takes that statement by Barr, you know, tweets it out. And then Trump sends out a second tweet, vastly exaggerating, you know, what Barr has said, but this is how Barr enables Trump. And Barr says, I'm sorry, Trump says, foreign governments have printed millions of fake mail-in ballots. The 2020 vote is fixed. And, and this is just terrifying and horrible for the country. I mean, if we have a contested election in November, and you have Bill Barr kind of enabling, you know, these crazy Trump's crazy claims by Trump. You know, I fear violence in this country um, between political factions, and that would be tragic. Um, so I, it's a very dangerous dynamic. Maybe Bill Barr is rationalizing that he's got a clear Lafayette Park because they're all anarchists and Antifa members. You know, that kind of rationale, that use of excessive force, is what's led to violations over and over in American history and, and dangerous discord. So I'm worried about all the conspiracy theories. Indeed. David Rode, uh, the book is In Deep, FBI, CIA, and the Truth About America's Deep State. Thanks so much for your time today. We'll put a link to that book at majority.fm. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Bye-bye.